is another fishing podcast. I am so happy that you have joined me today. It is January 23rd. Checking his notes. Yes, it is January 23rd. And we're going to have a fantastic podcast today because we're going to be talking about all kinds of interesting uh, big news. Interesting big news. Yes, interesting big news in fishing. Like this mind-blowing sonar, you're not going to believe. Heads up display fish finders. Wait till you hear this. More views of Jacob Wheeler, the Wheeler dealer. You know who I'm talking about. One of the greatest bass fishermen of all time. He's got a, um, he's got a, a new boat that's coming out. We got some new views of this boat. A new video of Mercury's electric outboard. You know, this thing's pretty intriguing, not going to lie. Uh, what to do to catch walleyes on pressured lakes? You know, most people, hey, we have pressured lakes around us. That's typically what a lot of average anglers are having to deal with, such as myself. Pressured walleye lakes. How do you fish them, for goodness sakes? And my filming and fishing disasters last week. So what do you say we get into it? This isn't another fishing podcast. This is another fishing podcast. All right. Well, if you're watching the video podcast, you've probably noticed the uh, set looks a little bit different today. And that's because I am kind of changing things up. I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to be showing video today. So I'm really excited. This is something new. Um, I've been wanting to do this for a long time. And it's, I, I finally uh, figured out the technology to be able to do this. So now I can show you all kinds of videos throughout the, uh, the, the World Wide Web. Is anybody still saying that, the World Wide Web? I miss those days, man. Like, remember, I'm talking way back, like, uh, like, like Microsoft Word, and there was like a little paper clip that would come up, and he was like a cartoon character. I mean, this is way back in the day when... I'm I'm dating myself. I don't care. But I'm talking in the 90s, man. Everybody was calling it the World Wide Web. I like just calling it the interweb now. But I can now show video that I, that I find off the internet. And I can bring it to you guys here. And uh, we can discuss, right? That's what's so exciting. But I am kind of cropping the shot differently today. So I can bring up video clips, bring up... Uh, it's it's not really for video clips. I'll, for the for the videos, I'll show you know those in the full screen. But for like little pictures and things like that, uh, it's going to be to my right uh, here. So I apologize if you're listening to this podcast. You really have no idea what I'm talking about. But um, we're going to kind of show uh, pictures and whatnot to my right and that's why I kind of have things framed up that way today. So um, I first want to get into this mind-blowing sonar. We're going to talk about, well, actually let's let's wait a little bit for that because I, I want to first talk about how absolutely depressing um, my week was last week. It wasn't, I mean, it wasn't depressing. That's a, a, a bit of a, uh, an exaggeration, but um, I, I got an, uh, the underwater Wednesdays we're doing, trying to do it, uh, on the regular, uh, on Wednesdays. I'm not going to always do underwater video on Wednesdays, but when I do do underwater videos in my tank, I like to, t uh, test, uh, lures underwater. Let's see what they look like. Maybe we'll even do other stuff. Maybe one day I'll put a fish in there and we'll, we'll, We'll watch a fish for a while. I don't know. There's a there's a lot of things that could be done with that with that tank. But for now, I like um, you know filming my my lures uh, underwater and seeing what they look like. And if you guys have any ideas uh, with what you'd like to see filmed underwater, maybe there's some baits that uh, you've want filmed. I got some feedback uh, recently. Um, uh, trout magnets, crappie magnets. I believe is the name of the lures. Um, I, I got a buddy that uh, that commented and didn't like to see those underwater, so I'll work on doing that. Uh, I'll, I'll buy some of those and check those out. I guess a lot of guys are using them. I don't even really know what they are, to be honest, but um, my curiosity is is definitely peaked. So we'll be uh, we'll be doing stuff like that um, on Wednesdays. But uh, I so last week I wanted to get my tank. Um, ready to be able to film wider, you know, lures 
wider, basically. So uh, what that means, what I'm trying to say is that if you have a presentation, a vertical presentation, like a jigging wrap style where that bait really swings out a lot, um, the reason I bought this particular tank is that it's wide, right? But it's wide in, in all, in, it's not, it's this perfect square. And I've got it so uh, when I'm vertical jigging a lure, it's directly center in the tank. And so for jigging wraps, particularly that style of bait, I needed enough room so that bait could really work out, and you know, work out to the sides. That bait goes every which uh, way. So um, uh, the problem, though, that I was having was that it's so difficult. I I want that background, and this is this is part of being a um, a professional video guy, right? is that I wanted that background to be black, to be as jet black as possible. I, I don't even want it to really necessarily look, um, I don't want it to necessarily look like I'm filming in an aquarium. I want the background to be very generic and I just want it to be dark in the back. I wanna be able to light the lure. Uh, you know, the lure I want uh, to be, to really stand out, right? So. What I found though is when you, it's, it's one thing to get a great shot when you're zoomed into the lure, you can get, you know, you're, you're close to it, the lure isn't moving very much, but on those jigging wrap style baits, um, they, it's, it's very, very difficult because when you zoom out, you can see more of the aquarium. I am using like a black fabric, and at first I just had that black fabric uh, basically, it was it was behind the glass, right? So it was behind the glass, and I thought that would be just fine. Zoom out, you know, and and I would be able to get these you know jigging wraps and see how far they swung out. It'd be a great, beautiful shot, but that didn't work out quite like that. Um, as soon as I zoomed out, I saw reflections everywhere. There was reflections. On the back glass, there was reflection, uh, reflections on the front glass. It was one of the most frustrating things I've ever had to uh, to deal with in, in a filming situation, to, to be able to get this thing um, looking better as far as no reflections. Also, one of the things that was really, really frustrating is that I could see the fabric more of the backdrop. I, I didn't want to be able to see any folds of the fabric and the reflections were crazy so I actually had to bring the fabric uh, I had actually I had to use more black fabric and bring it actually into the aquarium dunk it underwater and then that helped with the reflections um, on the back glass and so that kind of helped but my point in all of this is that it took so long to get this thing um, dialed in to get this shot dialed in that wide shot dialed in that I didn't get that that video up until late Wednesday night and I was just like I just got to get this thing up I don't know if anybody's even awake to be able to watch this thing but I put it up late Wednesday night and I was like I get it just I just got to get this thing out the door so uh, that was a major major pain you know, doing that. Um, and so that kind of, it, it was a, it was a learning experience, but I got to tell you, shooting underwater, you know, it's one thing to get a really close up shot of a lure, but when you're, when you're getting a wider shot, um, it'd be one thing if I, you know, I had a 200 gallon tank, something like that, but I only have so much, uh, space to work with. So to make that look, as generic as a background, make it not look like it's in a tank. Uh, it's very, very difficult. I found out the hard way. So my, apologize, uh, my apologies if you're looking for a video sooner, um, but uh, I, the video got out, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy that that, that happened. So um, ice fishing is hard, y'all. I, I, so I went ice fishing for the first time Oh gosh, it was uh, it was sat. Let's. I gotta make this. I, it was Saturday. No, Friday. It was Friday. I went. I believe it was Friday. I, so you know, when you get to be my age, you, you lose track of days, and um, it's it's a sad deal. But I. So 
my truck has been absolutely encased in, we have had a ton of snow in Minnesota this year. And so my truck has been encased. It's just been like in an, in an icy, uh, in an icy coffin. And I have not used my truck at all, uh, this winter. It, it, with the exception of like finally getting it out on Friday, I spent probably about two hours digging this thing out, digging my beloved 1995 Chevy Silverado truck out of the driveway. And it was such a chore. I cannot even, um, again, can't even tell you, I haven't had that much exercise in a very long time. I'm still sore for doing it, but I eventually got that, that truck out and then got all my ice fishing gear ready, headed north to a chain of lakes called the Horseshoe Chain of Lakes, um, which is about an hour or so north of me. And I, uh, it, it was, this spot I, I've gone to on a regular basis. In fact, I did a video uh, back in August on this lake and caught some really nice channel catfish, got a tip from uh, Darren Troseth, a uh, buddy of mine, also has a YouTube channel. Um, uh, and you should definitely check him out. Detro, I think is Detro. Check out Detro. Just type in Detro, D-T-R-O, in YouTube, and you should be able to find his YouTube channel. I should know more, like, what his exact YouTube channel is. But but I had been out to this spot in the summertime, and I have I've ice fished it a number of times, and I've done really well. But I went out to the spot. I don't have a, an ATV or, you know, anything like that, a snowmobile to get me out there. So, and I only have a two-wheel drive truck. I'm I'm a real um, I'm really kind of not prepared uh, to, to to really be very very um, proficient at ice fishing. In fact, I'm always worried I'm going to get stuck. But I parked, um, I didn't, I parked like where in, on solid ground on my truck and I, and I, on this, I have this clam Nanook shelter. I got dusted off all the equipment, my first ice fishing foray this year. And, um, I'm dragging this, I got a chest harness for this, for this, uh, for this clam shelter and I'm dragging it out to the spot and it's slushy as all get out. You wouldn't believe how bad the ice conditions are this year up in Minnesota, but they're really, they're really not good. And I'm going through slush, you know, you, you're, you're walking each step is like, you're just busting through slush. And I, it was, it was uh, not an enjoyable experience. I was huffing and puffing the whole time out there. I eventually get to the spot, drill some holes, drop the transducer down, and I'm not seeing what I want to see as far as like when you're when there are catfish in the area, what happens is you just see you basically see bigger marks and they just kind of I'm I'm using a I'm not using a Vexilar. I'm using a Humminbird, you know, regular um, you know, LCD fish finder. Uh, you know, like just a regular graph. And when that, when you know you're, you're around catfish, you'll just see bigger marks and they just kind of streak more. They're moving up and down the water column more. Whereas if it's like a crappie or something like that, or a, you know, a, a bluegill, those marks are just staying there. They're, they're not moving nearly as much. They're just more steady. You can see that there's the fish down there. There's just a mark down there. It's just a steady with a graph. It's just a steady mark just streaming um, across the, the screen. Um, if it's catfish, it's a bigger mark showing up, and they're moving more. That, 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 that uh, mark on the graph is just, it's, it's not just stationary. So I didn't see anything the whole night that looked like catfish. I'm, I'm fishing a point that breaks off in like 30 some odd feet of water. You typically for catfish, channel catfish in the winter, first of all, you need to fish a spot that's got good numbers of catfish. That's the tip of the, the week right there. To, to really, um, you know, do well catfishing uh, and just fishing in general, you need to fish in places that's, that have good populations. That's really so much of fishing is go to lakes that have good populations of fish. If you don't, then you're, you know, it's, it's just, you're, you're not gonna, I know this sounds like a no brainer, but 
That's why everybody in Canada is always catching fish. It's because there's hardly anybody up there. And there's way more fish up there than humans. That's why everybody looks like a pro up there. But anyway, I digress. So I go to this, uh, this spot. I don't see any, anything happening. There's, no, there's nothing that really looks like catfish. And, um, and, but, you know, this, this spot has been really good to me in the past. It's just a basin area. That's where you want to you wanna look for channel catfish in the winter. Look for kind of the deepest area um, of the lake, the basin area. And I'm not talking super deep necessarily, but like 30 feet. Like ideally, ideally, and things are very rarely ideal in fishing, but you would look for a flat, right? And then, I mean, you, in that flat, there would be a deep hole. And that's where you would find the catfish at. So look for that kind of situation where um, you have a, a, a shallower area and then access to like one of the deepest areas of the lake. And what I've found is those fish in the daytime, they're kind of out in that basin area. Uh, but as the sun gets lower, then they kind of cruise up and get more shallow. And I think as you get into later winter, they get more and more shallow. So, um, but I, you know, I'm, I, I drilled a few holes off that point. It's a point that just, it's a very, very prominent point that then just breaks off into uh, a, you know, a deeper, uh, like I said, a, a basin area, like a deeper hole. And I usually set up, uh, set up right at the point of that hole, and there was just nothing. It, it was just, it was dead. It was a frozen, dead sea. Very, very disappointing. Very disappointing. Especially when you consider all the work of digging out my truck and then, uh, you know, with my chest harness, pulling my clam the nook shelter all the way out there, drilling all kinds of holes, and not catching a damn thing. So, but that's fishing. And I got to tell you, it was good just to get every, you know, all the dust off my equipment. My Mr. Buddy heater, I got to tell you, I haven't had that thing on in a while, in a while. And that thing started up really, I mean, it was like nothing. It was, it was no problem. So kudos to Big Buddy, Mr. Heater, Big Buddy. Um, I, I was, uh, you know, it, it was it was good that that thing worked so well. My uh, my auger, my ion R auger, which I love so much, no problems with that. It just felt good actually to be in my shelter and out. Uh, you know, I stayed out there till probably about 10, 1030. And there was a guy that got stuck out there, which is I heard him spinning. There was this area of slush. And I, first of all, I was kind of surprised that people were driving because we've, like I said, we've had really bad conditions, ice conditions this year. And I was pretty surprised that there were people driving on the ice. Uh, there were, there were some cars that were parked um, on the ice, but near the, the, the launch, you know, the landing, the, the ramp. Um, and so I was like, well, that, I mean, that's probably what kind of a winter this is going to be. People aren't going to be driving much, you know, out on the ice. Well, later on that night, three guys, three or four guys came out in their cars. One of them got stuck in this slushy area. I, uh, I don't know. I don't have cojones like that, man. No, thank you. So it was, you know, it was a bust. I hate, um, you know, I, I even like contemplated uh, maybe show, you know, editing this video just putting it up there, but I don't know. I have, I still, I, I have a hard time just putting up a video where I, I, I don't catch anything. I know some guys have done that on YouTube and um, I, the rationale there is that, and I get it, you know, like it's, it's good just to see other people getting their asses handed to them, you know, and, and that's fine. But for me, it would have been very difficult having to edit all that. I just didn't feel like it was worth watching. So <laughs> I just, I, uh, I'm going to delete that footage. So I'm going to try my best um, this week. I'm going to, my buddy Pete Wagner, if you've been following this, this venture, another fishing podcast, you know, Pete used to be on here all the time. I want him back. I'm going to try to talk to him. We're going to go ice fishing on Thursday. Um, I'm going to try to get him back on this podcast. Uh, if not on the regular, on the somewhat regular I think it would be uh, it would be good for me. I know because I do not. It feels very difficult 
Um, it is very difficult doing one of these alone. And I like talking to people. So right now I'm talking to, I know I'm talking to you guys and I know uh, there's people listening, people watching, and I appreciate that very much. Um, and I, I'm getting better at doing this alone. It's just, you know, it's weird just talking to a camera here. I feel like I'm talking to myself, you know, but I'm, I'm working through it. We'll get better at this as we go. I'm excited now. Just today I figured out how to um, do video uh, for these podcasts. So now we can, we can now watch videos together. All right, so what what else do I need to? Yeah, so it was I didn't catch anything, um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna still keep on going out there. I got all my fishing gear ready to go now, and um, we're we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna attempt it again soon. So let's get into uh, what is happening in the world. I want to make sure. Yeah, so we are we are gonna be trying to fish with Pete on Thursday. What I'm thinking is there's a lake near me. Um, that I'll probably uh, we'll probably meet up at uh, probably doing some crappie, bluegill, you know, sunfish, that kind of a thing, a panfish outing, and uh, it'll be good. I'll I'll film it. I'm telling you, if we catch one fish, I'll I'll edit it. If we don't catch a fish, I'm not going to edit it. I will get that thing up. Um, it'll work to get that thing up on Friday. So that is the plan for this week the week of january 23rd i hope you guys are having a great winter catching lots of fish and what do you say we get into the uh fishing news that's happening i think i've covered everything that i wanted to cover uh oh yeah so underwater wednesday so we got wednesday coming up here going to be doing underwater before we get into the fishing news yeah let's talk about underwater wednesday so I've got two, last week I did the, um, I did the jigging wraps and what, you know, what jigging wraps. So did, did the jigging wrap, original jigging wrap, what that looks like underwater. I'm super impressive how those things swing out um, and are so erratic. I really, until I did this video, um, it was a tremendous pain in the ass to do the video. But once I did the video, um, I was thankful to have done it because I really have a better understanding of how erratic that kind of lure is, jigging wraps, that that genre of baits. They're super erratic, uh, you know, down, you know, Missouri, and they call them ice jigs, but jigging wrap style lures. They're super erratic. Um, the What impressed me the most from doing those videos is... I was most impressed with the jigging shad wrap. The jigging, the j original jigging wrap is very narrow, um, and it looks great, very erratic, and it was, you know, really the original, that uh, bait that came out with that action. And so kudos to Rapala for coming up with that bait. It's crazy just uh, the design of it, but, um, I, the, the action is amazing, right? But if you look at the action of the jigging shad wrap, and it's not so much the action. The action is very similar. I think it falls a little slower. But the, the profile of that bait, I think, looks way more natural to something that you'd find. You know, it's, de it's dependent on the forage that's in your body of water, right? So if you have a lot of, like, thin forage, you know, like... Um, smelt, um, you know, like uh, uh, shiner minnows, things like that. Uh, it, it mimics those very well. But particularly on bodies of water where the fish are eating sunfish, panfish, you know, more broad profile forage, um, you know, small young of the year crappies, that kind of thing, young of the year bluegill, you know, like juvenile uh, bait fish. Uh, juvenile, you know, crappies and, and uh, bluegills, sunfish, green sunfish, all kinds of, you know, all the different species of panfish. That shad, jigging shad wrap looks really, really, uh, really, really good. I mean, it, it, it mimics, I, there'd be times I'd, I'd jig that thing and it'd go out, it'd kick out and it'd come back and kick out again. And every time it would kick out, that profile, that bait, it looked very similar 
to like a little crappie, a little juvenile crappie or a little bluegill. So I, I personally, um, you know, I've not, I've not fished a jigging wrap that much, but I think in the future, first of all, I'm super, I, I know, I understand that bait way better now. Um, and it's because of how erratic it is, it's super important to have that in your arsenal for all species, crappies, walleyes, um, you know, I'm talking primarily the ice fish, the, the fish that bite readily, you know, under the ice. Um, it's, that is going to be a really, really great bait, right? But as far as like, just the, how it, the, the profile, um, it, I, I am super impressed with the way that jigging shad, uh, shad wrap looks. So I'm really gonna, I'm going to go in any more jigging wraps I buy are going to be jigging shad wraps. That's how impressed I was with, with the jigging shad wrap. So there it is. Um, but I think this coming Wednesday, I'm probably going to go and fish, uh, or, you know, demonstrate in the, in my tank, the, um, I've got some puppet minnows, Northland puppet minnows, which are that genre. This is what I'm debating. So I'm either going to do puppet minnows, what they look like uh, underwater, which is the same style of, of bait as the jigging wraps. Um, I also have some tika minnows uh, from clam. That could be very interesting. Um, and also some Euro tackle plastics. So that, uh, that basically are like panfish baits. With little tiny uh, panfish baits, uh, and Euro tackle has really come along. Well, they're they're a cool um, uh, bait company because the guy that runs it, I believe he's from Europe, and he's bringing some of that Europe, uh, that European kind of um, influence into his baits, and these really microplastics that he's making are really impressive. And so um, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to feature those underwater and just uh, check out how they look. So I, I, I'm debating whether to do the, the Euro Tackle Micro Soft Plastics or the Tika Minnow or the, um, what was the, the Puppet Minnow, the Northland pup, Puppet Minnow. So I think I'm probably going to go, um, I'm probably going to do the, the, uh, the Euro tackle or, you know, the Euro tackle, the microplastics, that's probably what I'll do on Wednesday, but, um, it's going to be one of those three, one of those three. So that's what's happening on Wednesday. And then, uh, don't have a fishing video plan on Friday yet, but hopefully, uh, go out on Thursday with my buddy Pete, do a quick turnaround edit for Friday of us catching loads and loads of, uh, crappies or, panfish, you know, bluegills, something like that. That's the plan. So let's get into the fishing news. And again, this is exciting as if you're watching the video podcast and if you're only listening to the podcast right now, which is awesome, I'm glad that you're listening to the audio podcast. You can watch the video podcast by going to our YouTube channel called Angling Uploaded. Go to Angling Uploaded, just type that into YouTube. You'll find us and you'll be able to go into our playlist, another fishing podcast, and you'll be able to watch um, this, this video. So this, uh, this video podcast. And my framing this week is different than in past because I'm going to bring up um, my right, on my right side here, I'm going to bring up uh, pictures. I'm, this is, it, listen, I'm learning, I'm going to crack open, I got to... I got a uh, Coke Zero here that I need to crack open. I'm starting to get a dry mouth. But we are going to be um, kind of changing up here a little bit, changing some different things. And you'll notice uh, if you're watching the video podcast and maybe if you're just listening, you'll hear like a buzzing sound. And it's because I've got this, uh, I've got a, um, I, I got a neon light that's on. And I love it. It's a Schlitz beer neon light. And it's on right now. And it's making kind of an annoying sound. And I don't really know. Maybe it, it's going to like be really annoying uh, to listen to. So this might be the last time you hear this thing. But 
I love the way it looks and do not obviously love the way it sounds. All right, let's get into it. What do you say? Let's do, uh, let's get this thing rocking. All right, so there is, um, this is brought to you by the fine folks at Bass Blaster. Go to Bla BassBlaster.com or sign up for their newsletter. Jay Kumar does this fantastic um, newsletter, email newsletter. And wait till you see this. Uh, future stuff, tracking a single fish on sonar, meaning not with your eyes, but with your sonar. Like this from Sonar Company, Coda Octopus. So that's the name of the Sonar Company. I'm gonna show you this video here in a second. But this uh, this Sonar Company is really impressive. Um, they, they, from what, and we're gonna look at the website here in a, in a second, but this company, this is like the most high-end sonar you can imagine for like deep sea exploration. And so, you know, you're looking, you're looking at, um, first of all, I, I, the, the amount of money that this sonar must cost has got to be freakish. Okay. Number one, but it's, it's, it's so crazy sophisticated, um, that not, it's 3d. And so let me just get into here what, uh, Jay Kumar at Bass Blaster is saying. He says, doesn't sound too far fetched if you have a mouse and enough processing. So it's got to require incredible processing power. By the way, on their website, so this sonar can track individual fish, right? And then you can, you can, the, it's, it's three dimensional, right? So you can kind of wrap around that fish. Wait till you see this. I'll show you here in a second. Um, and this is from their website. It says, this year, Coda Octopus has released several new products that are revolutionizing the subsea industry, including our Echoscope Parallel Intelligent Processing Engine called Pipe. Do you hear my cat right now? Sorry about that. That is Oliver, my loud, obnoxious, feral cat that we keep um, jailed inside. Um, it is, it's, so this, what's it called? Parallel Intelligent Processing Engine, Pipe, also known as, in the world's only 5D and 6D sonars. And Jay Kumar says, I thought we could only see, perceive in 3D. So what it means, like 5D and 6D sonars, is that this sonar company is using, uh, other kinds of technology to image objects. They're using LIDAR, which uses light. Um, there's, there's all kinds of diff different technologies. So check this out. This is from their uh, website here. So Echoscope CIVS. Echo Echoscope CIVS is close in visualization sonar, right? So <laughs> ultra high resolution, real time 3D imaging sonar system for short, short range applications. So on their website here, you can see like the, there's there's a picture of a cinder block and it looks like a cinder block. So it, it's just it's just crazy how so how far the technology of sonar has come, right? And then here's another shot here of uh, so this is the Echoscope pipe meets and exceeds I don't know what the hell they're talking about on this this website here, but so this pipe technology, it's sh in this in this picture on their website, they're um, basically how would you, we, they're imaging a whole structure that's underwater. So imagine like a, um, a bridge that maybe collapsed or some kind of, uh, like a deep sea oil rig structure. It's imaging that whole thing underwater and you could see it perfectly. Right. And so this sonar company is using all kinds of different techniques, different technologies to be able to image the sonar in different ways. Um, and yeah, it's, it's super, super impressive. So let me bring, this is, this is going to be the first video we've ever shown here at another fishing podcast. Are you excited? Uh, keep your fingers crossed. All right. This is, see, I have already brought up the wrong video. 
Uh, yeah, so that's how it goes here. That is, you know, this is this is flying by the seat of your pants, trying to do something for the first time you've never done before. Um, maybe I thought I had that video up here. Uh, hold, wait for it here. Um, I thought I, where did I put that? I guess I did not, um, I do not have video for this. I'm, I am mistaken. So the other crazy thing, there is automatic boulder detection. The survey engine automatic object detection package automatically detects boulders on the seabed and generates a comprehensive report on each detected boulder. So it's just, it's just crazy technology. I had a, a buddy that's from Lawrence, Chris Meyer. Uh, he works for, um, you know, he's been working for Lawrence for, for a long time. And he's told me that the technology for the, the sonar technology for the ocean is vastly, vastly uh, light. You know, it's like light years ahead of what's happening in freshwater fishing. Right. So they're doing stuff in for, you know, ocean sonar that it would blow your mind. So this is what they're doing. And eventually that is going to creep into and I say creep. Um, I, I don't mean that in a negative sense. I, I'm excited for this, but um, it's going to work its way into fishing eventually. And my buddy Chris mentioned that like it's this this stuff will get to fishing. It's you know, it's like the same thing with that happened with, um, you know, down scanning, side scanning. They were doing that in ocean applications years and years before uh, it came to freshwater fishing, came, came to fishing. So, um, you know, in, in forward-facing sonar, that's, that's the same thing. They, they've been doing that, um, you know, out, you know, in the ocean for years and years and years. And so now, uh, now we're able to, to, you know, use that technology and, and it's fantastic. So it's just kind of exciting to see what's around the uh the corner here with with uh sonar technology so um here's the video here's the video here um let's get this is it playing the, is the key well it's not playing for some weird reason it's not playing i don't know why it's not playing but um this vi this is a video here it's supposed to be a video but i'm working through this obviously and uh, this, this is a shot from a video where you see this green dot here. There's a green dot and you can, that's, you can move that dot and, and essentially highlight images that you're seeing. So if you see a, an image that's a fish, you can put that dot on that fish and it, it stays on that fish, holds on that fish, and then uh, you can actually wrap around um, and, and see the fish at different angles. I have no idea how they're accomplishing this, but it's really extraordinary. And I'm really annoyed at myself. Um, obviously I haven't fully understood this Ecamm live software that I'm using, uh, to be able to show you guys this yet, but I promise you that I will, um, I'll get my act together. I, I really, Oh my gosh, I, I wanted to show you this. But th the point being is that you can you can hone on a fish, mark it on this using this technology. It will track that fish. And then the other mind-blowing thing is that it it you can wrap around it's like you can see around that fish. Um so lots of exciting stuff coming down the pike for fishing and I, I don't know. I, I can't get enough of that stuff. But I will say um, it, it enters my mind. I do get somewhat concerned as far as like how far we are taking things. It's it's, you know, fisheries can only handle so much. Right. Um, and it's one thing if you're an area that doesn't have as much fishing pressure, not as many people. But when you can, forward-facing sonar, for instance, is a good example. If, if you can physically, um, you can see by sweeping the forward-facing sonar that there are fish out in front of you that you wouldn't necessarily know were out in front of you, but you know they're in front of you now. 
that's gonna, in my opinion, that's gonna that's gonna be that's gonna have an effect on on fishing. The more people that have that technology to use, okay. I'm not saying that we should ban it. I'm just saying that that's gonna have an effect. I I would say. Um, it's this, this technology, a forward facing sonar where you could see fish moving, you can see their fish, they're moving. Um, that is a pressure that I don't know that we're, uh, you know, especially is, is more, you know, the more common it becomes, the, the, the cheaper it becomes, uh, it's just, there's going to be more and more guys using it. So, um, uh, you know, it's just, it's that more important to really catch and release. We got to be protective of our fisheries, right? So with this newer technology that's going to come down the pike, it's, it's just, it's, it's, I'm excited about it, but I'm a little apprehensive too. And this falls into this uh, category, which is, and again, this is from Bass Blaster, Jay Kumar providing some excellent stuff this week. Um, so future stuff, how about this for our graphs? 3D rendering, no special glasses needed. And he's got a picture up here uh, um, that shows a, a lake, like from a, the point of view of an angler, you're looking at a lake, right? And in, you're seeing the contour lines of that lake. You're seeing the contour as if it was a topographic map laid out in front of you. And, you know, so you're, so it's like an overlay of, of a topographic map, an overlay of that onto your lake that you're looking at. Um, so remember this deal from 2021 ICAST? He says, a company was thinking about, not sure if they still are, bringing some kind of heads up display like this to the eyes of fishermen. So imagine you could wear like glasses, like, you know, sunglasses, and then you've got this image in front of you this topographic image of the lake you could see that the it's dropping off uh, if you're a shore fisherman i could see advantages to this you could see that oh there's a there's you know i'm right by a creek channel and i'm i can make a cast of the creek channel obviously if you're a boater there could be some advantages to this too but again this is we're getting to a point where this is like crazy crazy technology to be able to see that there's you know and, and you can see it obviously with your with your your mapping on your you know your units already right but this is just further um you know it's just, it's just an added uh, added technology to help your fishing complicate your fishing it could really make fishing not as fun i will say this one of the great things about fishing and why i got started into fishing what why i loved fishing let's put it this way one of the the things i loved most about fishing was the unknown um fishing it's it's the anticipation right it's the you don't know that where your fishing is going to be good necessarily whether there's fish there that's why you fish an area and you in and then you know you'll move on if nothing's happening right but part of the the reason i love fishing so much is that it's the unknown and it's the it's the excitement of going yeah i think this place is going to be awesome making casts and then feeling a bite and then catching a fish and then it, it's it's the whole just the visual uh, visualization um, of just, you know, and having a good imagination is important to be able to visualize well in your mind. And, and that, that to me plays a huge role in why fishing is so much fun. If you can know exactly what the playing field is out in front of you, I, you know, I see it's a huge advantage if you're a fisherman. Okay. Um, if you want to catch fish, if, especially if you're a competitive fisherman, but it's also takes away from that kind of unknown aspect of fishing and the fun of like wondering if there are any fish out there and I, I wonder if I could catch them, you know, and, and so I kind of worry about this technology going too far and just taking away 
from uh, from fishing, right? And just making it so like, oh, now I got to get the goggles. Now I... you're seeing it just with all the stuff that they're putting at the bow of boats nowadays. You know, at the console, I mean, you got two giant graphs and then at the bow, there's like three giant graphs now. Fine, if you're a competitive fisherman, I get it, you know, but boy, it can really like complicate fishing and fishing and, and that can be fine. I mean, I, I get that. That can, that, can, that can be a lot of fun, but you're, I, I, I think, I think it can, you, you don't want young anglers thinking they got to have all that stuff because to get hooked on fishing, it really doesn't have to, it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much at all, right? So um, my fear is that someone's going to think you need all that stuff and then they're going to try to, you know, they're going to get all that stuff or they're going to try to get all that stuff and then ship's going to break and then they're going to be like, you know, they're, they're, it's, fishing shouldn't, to to have fun fishing, it doesn't need to be complicated. That's all I'm saying. All right, rant over. So, um, back to this. Jay Kumar says, very cool in a way, but how would you do it? I figured some kind of gla go uh, goggles or glasses because we'd have to still see. Wouldn't want to step out of the bo uh, out of the boat or get dizzy or whatever. But what if no special glasses were needed? Right. So. And that's what's kind of wild now. So they are making displays. Okay, so this is at um, CES, I believe. It's the Consumer Electronics Expo. I don't know what the S stands for. Consumer Electronics, uh, I don't know. But uh, Jay says that the recent CES, cons oh, here it is, Consumer Electronics Show, laptop and display company Asus hyped their new upcoming spatial vision displays, the world's first glass-free, uh, glasses-free 3D OLED technology. And so um, check this out. We're going to try to bring this video. This will be the first video that we ever bring up on another fishing podcast. Keep your fingers crossed. Here we go. Let's uh, check this out. All right, so it says the world's first glasses-free 3D OLED technology, Asus Special Spatial Vision. Dual camera eye tracking. So you're looking at a laptop, if you're uh, just listening to this, it's a laptop and these 3D images are coming out from the laptop computer and being displayed like a jellyfish and this this woman and this man they're 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 moving the images around it's like showing 3d designers working on uh you know designs of of you know modeling and 3d modeling and these images are coming off of the laptop and they're displayed like over the keyboard of the laptop computer and so you could imagine that in the future, and what are we talking? We talking 10 years down the road, 15 years down the road, we might see something like this. Uh, maybe, maybe sooner, I don't know, um, but it's pretty wild. It's, uh, it's, I'm sure here's a guy, he's making friends with a uh, jellyfish. People are, there's jellyfish and fish coming out of their computers. So pretty, pretty cool technology that I would, you know, I would say that it would probably uh, be making its way to a fish finder at some point, uh, which is pretty, pretty darn exciting. I got to bring this back up. All right, here we go. I'm still not fully, um, I still haven't fully mastered the Ecamm Live software, but I'm, my wife just got home. Hi, sugar. Hi. There she is. Um, so yeah, that, you, you, that technology is without a doubt, I would say it's going to take some time, but it's going to, it's going to come to the fishing world. So these, these displays, um, you know, a fish finder that has like this three-dimensional display out in front, you would, it looks like these guys are, that are on this video, they're actually using hand gestures to um, actually move the, uh, uh, actually 
control the laptop computer. So I would imagine that you could even, you know, you could, you could, con you can use hand gestures to control uh, the fish finder. I don't know. Again, we'll see how this might play out, but it's pretty, pretty cool stuff nonetheless. Um, and so that was, I want to show you one other thing with this. Um, so the Asus Spatial Vision Technology had specially crafted optical layers to the surface of an LED, OLED display. It's like a high-tech glass sandwich that's bonded to the OLED panel with optical resin. Goodness gracious almighty. The filling consists of a lenticular lens layer that directs the stereo images separately to each eye and a switchable liquid crystal layer that lets you turn the LED effect on and off. So I don't know if you'd necessarily be able to control. It, it looked like they were controlling the laptop with their hands too, but it might have been just they were controlling uh, the images that were coming up on uh, on this uh, display in front of them, like this three-dimensional. It looks like a holographic image, basically, but a little bit more non-transparent it, it's than, a uh, than a hologram. So uh, who knows? But I thought that was pretty crazy. Um, it would not surprise me at all if, if this shows up, you know, in the fishing world down the road. But how, how long are we thinking? 10 years, maybe? Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, so then this is kind of gives you an idea of it shows this image I'm bringing up here kind of shows you how this screen is arranged. I could see Lawrence doing something like this. Chris Meyer is probably working on this right now. The OLED, the, I can't say OLED very well. The OLED display is covered with a specially crafted, I've already said this, right? No, 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 I have it. The OLED display is covered with a specially crafted lenticular lens, which ensures that separate stereo images are sent to your left and right eyes. This lets you see stereoscopic 3D visuals with your naked eyes, an effect known as auto stereoscop audio stereoscopy. Uh, switch smoothly between 2D, yeah. Yeah, switch smoothly between 2D and 3D visual, visualization, easy for me to say, with one click. So, wow, yeah, it's uh, we're moving at a highly, very, um, extremely scary, rapid technology pace. And let's see how far we go in the fishing realm. But I'm sure we're going to be seeing some of this stuff pop up uh, in fishing. So... Thought I'd share that with you. Thank you to Bass Blaster and Jay Kumar there. And uh, the next thing, so I've talked about this in the last podcast. So Jacob Wheeler, who is, you know, I think he's he, he, currently, without a doubt, the best angler. But he is he is probably the greatest angler. I I, I don't I can't listen. Van Dam is astonishing. I worked with Van Dam a ton. Um, Let's just put it this way. Wheeler's a phenom, okay? Wheeler is a phenom. So he's got a, a new boat that he's helping design coming out by HCB Yachts. And there, uh, there's, a new, um, there's a new video out that I'm going to show you here shortly. Um, but so this is on their YouTube channel, um, HCB Yachts, HCB Yachts. Uh, as a tribute to the original Hydra, and HCB Yachts is, they've got an affiliation with Hydra Sports. I think they might have bought that brand. Anyway, let me just read this. This is from their YouTube channel. As a tribute to the original Hydra Sports bass boats that, gra that graced the waters almost a half century ago, HCB, Yacht, HCB Yachts proudly introduces the new Icon boat brand to the marketplace with our first LX. LX21 and LX20 editions. Uh, and these are going to be uh, shown for the first time March 24th through the 26th of this year at the Bassmasters Classic in Knoxville, Tennessee. So um, let me bring this up here. Boy, can you hear that neon uh, sign now? All right, so check this out. This is a video uh, from 
this uh, HCB Yachts on YouTube and describe it if you're listening to the podcast, not watching the video podcast. So it's showing some images. It's, sh it's basically showing Jacob Wheeler out on a on a big, um, uh, big like offshore boat center center console uh, in the ocean and they're going for looks like sailfish and so it's kind of showing that HCB yachts they're known for their saltwater stuff and it also looks like um, we've got some other professional bass fishermen with them Jacob Wheeler's catching a big fish right now and so we're getting through this video we've got a ha about halfway into this video you're gonna see this new uh, bass boat offshore fish I mean, there's a dorado also known as a dolphin also known as a mahi mahi and that is a corvina i think i'm kind of speaking out of my butt right here because i don't know my saltwater species as well so now we're getting into this new icon bass boat and it's it's kind of interesting it's almost like the hole on it is almost like a tri-hull design um also, back in the day, they used to call it a cathedral-style hull. Uh, Jay Kumar, who uh, I, I, he he brought this attention, uh, brought this video to my attention, thanks to the Bass Blaster newsletter he uh, puts out. Uh, he mentioned that they're not they're not showing um, any kind of shots of the of the bow much, so. There's probably going to be some some interesting things that they do with the bow, which I'm excited about. It's a giant bow, big big, uh, a lot of space. Basically, the bow is from the console. It's like, you know, from the console all the way up. It's it's more looks like it's more than half the boat, which I think big big front decks are the deal. Um, but it's pretty cool to see what they're doing there. It's in Jacob Wheeler is a real stickler, so he's going to I know he's going to be taking his or has taken his time really designing this thing. So I'm interested and in, I know there's a lot of uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about this boat. So I'm I'm excited to see what he what he's done with it and I I there's you know, this thing's going to be dialed, I'm sure. So it's going to be really really cool to see uh, what Jacob has come up with this bass boat. So um, now, speaking of boats, I've talked about this uh, on the last podcast, I believe. I, I brought about uh, brought up this electric outboard for Mercury. The 7.5E is what they're calling it. The Avatar, Avatar, and so seven. It's basically seven and a half horsepower. They're saying 7.5E. But I like the looks of this thing. I, you know, can this thing be a tiller? I wonder. Can you have this as a, or a, a, I mean, a, a kicker is what I meant. Can you have this thing as a kicker motor? What are the benefits of this pot potentially being a kicker motor? Are there any benefits of this being a kicker motor? Um, I like the way this thing looks, though. The lines, pretty darn, you know, clean. Um, not pretty darn clean. They're really clean. Uh, and I, it's, it's, it's interesting, too, because how you put the battery in, I'll show you this video here in a second, but it's just, it loads, you know, if you want to change a battery out, it's a simple just popping the top of the motor and then sliding this, this battery right into it. Sort of similar to what you do with an ice auger, you know, an, an electric ice, you know, electric auger for ice fishing. It just, it's, it slips in really simple. And really no hassle the biggest thing for me for an electric outboard um for it to to it, it's and what i noticed and i've said this in the past too with like an electric auger you notice immediately just it's so much less hassle so having an electric outboard where you don't have to worry about oil changes um you know or just the maintenance on it is so much less you don't have to worry about gas, buying gas for it, um, and any and you just with the maintenance there should be less uh, problems that can occur to it out on the water, right? Um, there's just outboard motors I've noticed are just kind of notorious for things just going wrong, and so if you have less moving parts, 
I would say that that would be a positive, right? Obviously, they haven't made an electric motor that's very big yet. And so that's the, that's the, the limiting factor here is that you just don't, you know, you can only have um, an electric outboard that's so, so strong. So, um, but on their website here, I, I thought this was, uh, this was, this was interesting because they kind of, they kind of go through some of the features here of this motor. So reliable, efficient power, advanced battery technology, smart charging, intelligent uh, displays, Mercury Marine app, so you, there's an app for it, and a high efficient prop. So let's just start with the reliable, efficient power. Industry-first industry, uh, industry transverse flux motor technology generates high torque with little effort, maximizing battery life to extend your range while providing quick acceleration and efficient performance. Um, and then to the advanced battery technology, engineered exclusively for marine duty, Avatar lithium-ion batteries are a safe, efficient 48-volt power source that keeps your adventures moving. Modular and portable designs let you bring along the power you need, which I think is fantastic. I'm curious how heavy each battery is, though. Uh, smart charging, Avatar... Smart chargers have you covered. They constantly monitor voltage and current to deliver a safe, effective charge on a standard household outlet. We're also offering the option to upgrade to a faster charger so you can, cho so you can choose a charge time that meets your needs. Uh, intelligent displays, vivid full color displays provide all the information you need to enjoy your, uh, your boating adventures, including range estimates in an up-to-the-second battery life meter that you, let you explore with confidence. They're optimized for easy viewing in all light conditions. Then there's an app, the Mercury Marine app. Make the most of any journey with the SmartCraft Connect module available as an accessory this for the 7.5e outboard. It provides access to all the features of the new Mercury Marine app, including a GPS map with visualized range estimates digital gauges, and more. And lastly here, high efficiency prop. Uh, it, it looks like a, a kind of a lame prop, but it's an electric motor, right? So <laughs> the hyd hydrodynamic lower unit and durable ultra efficient prop were made to move. They effortlessly carve through the water, maximizing runtime for maxima maximum fun. So um, interesting uh, features there for this motor. And here is a, wait a minute, wait for it. Here is the, um, the YouTube video of this uh, new outboard. What if every journey began with the push of a button? Where would you go? With the Mercury Avatar 7.5e electric outboard, all you need is a destination. It's your invitation to fully immerse in the natural world around you. So, the outboard's portable design yeah, so this, and it's crazy. It shows a woman here walking, walking with it. Uh, looks, so looks, can be ready, no actually, where adventure takes you. yeah, it looks very light. There's shots of explore, this being used on display, kayaks, on smaller aluminum deep V boats, on inflatables. And I like it too. There's a shot of of uh, just putting the the battery right in the top of it. Just an easy lid. It looks really really light. Here's another picture of a guy just easily picking it up and moving it. So it's I'm intrigued by this because it could be a great option for uh, kayaks could be a, a, a great option for just, it, obviously it's a great option for smaller boats, but I had not thought about it for, for kayaks. There's a, they show video of it being on a kayak. Uh, the biggest thing was, would be, you know, I have a Traxxas, a, a 55 horse, or excuse me, a 55 pound thrust um, Minn Kota Traxxas for my kayak. I have a 12 foot kayak. So is that something that, you know, what would be the benefits 
of having this as opposed to a um, like a Minn Kota Traxxas where I have, you know, a big, heavy, you know, 12 volt battery that I got to carry around. Um, how long does that battery last on the Avatar? And first of all, how much does this thing cost? How much does the battery, uh, how long does it last? And, you know, how heavy is that? It doesn't, that's the thing. It doesn't look, when you think of my setup, so I have the Traxxas motor, and then I have that big 12 volt battery that I'm that is on the back of you know the the kayak. So that's a heavy, heavy you know with the trolling motor, and then with that battery, that's a that's a, you know adding a lot of weight to my kayak. So in this video, seeing this thing carried around like it's not not very heavy, doesn't look any heavier than just my trolling motor. My you know my, it's I'm sure it's a little bit heavier than that, but then when you factor in the battery that I have to have for my trolling motor, um, it, it's I, it's probably my setup that I have currently is probably, it looks like it's quite a bit heavier than this would be. So uh, this could be a great option for kayak anglers. Um, it can be just a great option for people that, you know, they can't on their bodies of water next, you know, near them, they can't use, they have to use an electric, uh, uh, um, you know, outboard or electric motor. So, um, I see it, I see it being really, uh, handy for that. The fact that it's just easy to put a battery in there, um, and you can carry multiple batteries with you. Um, that could be a, 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 a real plus, but again, you got to know how long that thing is going to run. Um, and what, I mean, the biggest things for me are how long is that battery going to last? How fast is this thing going to go? And um, how expensive it is, right? That's, that's what's kind of like I, I'm thinking about here with this, but I love it. Um, I would, uh, I'm, I really want to know what this thing costs. So I'm, I'm, uh, very, very interested and curious about this, uh, this new motor for Mercury. And lastly, um, I did want to, uh, get into this because I find, um, I find, it can, you know, catching walleyes is, can be very difficult, especially when everybody up here in the north, they want to target uh, walleyes. And speaking of target walleyes, I found this at Target Walleye. Go to targetwalleye.com. Brett McComas does a wonderful job there. Uh, also has a fantastic newsletter. So check out the Target Walleye newsletter. Sign up for that. Highly recommended. And uh, Brett has got a uh, YouTube channel, Target Walleye YouTube channel. Check it out. He's got video where he, he goes into what I'm about to talk about here. But um, I catching walleyes in this part of Minnesota where I'm at, I, I live in kind of, I live in central Minnesota. Um, it can be very difficult. It's not like, you know, you get into Canada, you get farther up into northern Minnesota, you get into Canada, less pressure, more bodies of water. Um, the, the, I would argue that the fishing is much easier, but when you get down here, you get closer to the, you know, Minneapolis, St. Paul, there's more pressure. Everybody wants to catch walleyes and so many people love eating walleyes. It can be very difficult catching walleyes, uh, uh, just in general, but it can be, it can be pretty difficult, uh, in the winter. Um, especially because you're, you can't be as mobile, a lot of times than if you were in a boat. Um, there's just there's just more, I would argue there's more of an effort that has to be made when you're ice fishing. But I thought this was really cool that Brett brought, uh, brought this up because in so much in fishing, we make it seem like, oh my God, we're just, you know, we're, we're, we're catching fish all the time. And you see pictures of like giant walleyes, you know, and, and everybody's a pro and, you know, and I don't get me wrong. I, I, on our social media, you know, on Instagram, I mean, I post the, the big small mouth that I catch and I know how to kind of make a small mouth, maybe look bigger than it really is. I mean, you know, I'm a professional, uh, you know, I've been working in the fishing industry for, 23 years now, I guess. So, but I do, I always like it when someone gets, gets real, you know, and just tells it like it is. And, and Brett, Brett did that here. He said, um, uh, in this little post that he, that he did, uh, in Target Walleye, he writes, uh, this is the, the headline here, after dark walleye on clear pressured lakes. 
Where I'm at in central Minnesota, you've typically only got about an hour window at sunrise sunset where you can consistently catch a couple of walleyes. And then in parentheses, if you're lucky, Brett's being super on. That's the reality of how hard it can be to catch a walleye in these parts, okay? Outside of that, good luck. Basically have to burn up PTO, so paid time off to make it up for either of those bites. If you want to try and catch a few walleyes during working man's hours, on average backyard lakes, so basically, you know, the, the average lakes that, that people are, are fishing, try setting up on a gradual sandy break line or point and catch them roaming through after dark. Also a great spot to set up uh, the wheelhouse if you want those rattle reel alarm clocks to run, uh, to cut into your sleep. So yeah, he's, you know, good advice there. Brett knows what he's talking about. Um, he's, uh, he's, you know, he fishes walleyes, uh, you know, and he's running the target walleye, uh, you know, um, newsletter and, 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 and he, obviously he knows walleyes, right? So that's great advice, but I like that he's being real because sometimes I'm like, I, I, you know, I try to go out and catch walleyes and I just more often than not, Quite honestly, especially ice fishing, I just, I have my ass handed to me on a platter, on a big plate. And so it's just nice to be able to, to, to see someone getting honest and like going, yeah, you know what, I'm, um, you know, I write about walleyes a lot and I, I fish for walleyes, uh, you know, and, and, I, and they, they, are, they can be very tough to catch. So that gave me some encouragement, especially after I got skunked so bad last week. So I just thought I'd share that with you and, uh, and just say, you know, don't get down on yourself. If, if you've gotten skunked, if fishing's been tough this winter, it's just part of fishing. You'll be okay. I'm giving you a big hug right now. We'll get through this together. All right. So with that being said, I think I'm going to wrap this up. Thanks for joining me. It's uh, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be a fun week. I am gonna try to go ice fishing with Pete Wagner. Yes, Pete Wagner is back. We're gonna try to get him back at least. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. I'll uh, I'll see you guys next week.